Okay, so Osmo RFDS or the um, RF delay simulator because that's the best name I could come up with. Uh, so wait, how do I? Oh wait, it's not exactly. Okay, that's better. Um, so when the uh, what the name says pretty much what it does, right? Uh, it simulates an RF delay, which means you have an RF port which takes an input signal and it transmits that same input signal on the output port some time later, hopefully a deterministic time later. Um, at the moment, it's just a simple delay, but it could be you know, extended to actually simulate multipath or things like that um, as the need arises for it. Um, so why... Did I do that? Well, the goal was to, you know, integrate with uh, uh, the GSM uh, tester at Sysmocom, which has a, you know, different hardware connected and stuff like that to, to test it. And uh, and mainly the this particular piece would be to, you know, experiment with the timing advance um, at the lowest layer possible, so that you test the entire stack. Because you know, with virtual phi and stuff like that, you can simulate. Uh, the timing advance at different layers of the protocol and things like that, but here it's to really have it on the um, on the yeah exactly the, the real device you know you just, um, and so yeah and uh, uh, Aralt was looking for a solution uh, for that for uh, for Sysmocom and uh, and the Pluto was uh, seemed like a good solution uh, other options that were uh, considered were RF over fiber with you know long spools of fibers or long RF cables, stuff like that. Uh, so this is a little more software defined. Uh, yeah. So the, t the target device uh, is the Adam Pluto, which is you know, basically a zinc connected to an ADI 9361. Why this device? Well, mostly we have plenty of them around and uh, we need to find something useful <laughs> to use them for, right? So. Uh, that that seemed like a, a, a good match. Um, the the build system to generate custom images and custom applications uh, from ADI actually works astonishingly well. Like you, if you follow the the instruction, you you will get a working image uh, out of the box. It it, it yeah it works. Um, what's a bit annoying about those images loaded on, on on there is that there is no provision for any kind of persistence, which means that every time you plug it and, and unplug it and it reboots, uh, everything will be lost. There is no overlay for persistence or anything like that, um, at least that I could find. Which is a bit annoying because uh, the FPGA image is actually needed on boot, um, and which means that every time you want to change the FPGA image, you actually need to rebuild and reflash on a completely uh, a new image. The, the Zinc itself allows changing the FPGA configuration um, on the fly, but something somewhere in the ADI's logic doesn't like that. Uh, and the Linux side will work fine, but you won't be able to talk to any of the uh, SDR part, which you know, kind of defeats the point uh, in this application. Um, yeah, other minor issue is that by default, they use RNDIS uh, for the, so on the, um, when you plug that on your laptop, you get a CDC. Uh, you know, console basically. You also get a network device, and they use RNDIS. Um, I patched the image. Use ECM, which is uh, more standard, and mostly because I didn't have the driver for N RNDIS, and I didn't want to build them. <laughs> I had the S ECM one. Uh, same thing, SSH keys, because again, everything is lost at reboot. If you want to add your own SSH key, you actually have to rebuild an entire image um, with that. Uh, which makes me think that it's very possible that the pre-built image that's distributed on the website actually comes with my SSH key uh, as allowed to log in as root on the device. You know, <laughs> just beware of that. So <laughs> IIO. Um, so IIO so is the you know f framework for um, that's been made by ADI to interface with various things. It wasn't especially designed with SDR in mind. It was you know all industrial sensors and that kind of stuff, and it's been kind of forced into being used uh, for SDR in this application. And so when you log in um, on the Linux running on the Zinc, you get an I/O device, and and that's how you're supposed to talk to the uh, SDR part. Um, I try to implement the loopback and uh, and everything using purely I/O because. IO gives you those buffer objects, and so the hope was that you'd be able to, you know, 
get a buffer from the RX and then feed it to the TX uh, so that the zinc wouldn't have any actual work to do except shuffling buffer around. Um, there's a variety of ways for which that didn't work. The first thing is that the IO buffer is really just, it's an opaque wrapper. You have no idea what's inside and it doesn't actually, there is no mapping between, um, uh, there's no constant mapping between the uh, IO buffer object and the physical buffer. They they will switch the, the physical buffer inside the same IO buffer, uh, and so you can't just give them uh, and, and consider them as mapping to a, a constant area in memory. Uh, the other problem is that that opaque wrapper is actually tied to a specific I.O. channel. So you can't use an I.O. buffer that you got for Eric's and send it to TX. That just doesn't work that way. And you, I tried meddling around in, in the inside of I.O. but couldn't get anything to work. Um, and that wouldn't have done any good for the two reasons that follow. Is that I.O. has no timestamp whatsoever. So you can't tell him to transmit a, a buffer at a, at a defined time, or you can't get the time at which you received an Eric's buffer. You also have absolutely no way to start Eric's and takes pass at the same time, uh, because there is no time command or thing like that, which means depending on uh, when the Linux would issue the actual rights to the memory mapped IO to start and stop the DMAs engine, the loopback delay of that RF delay simulator was basically random on boot. It would be more or less constant, but random, and you couldn't choose it, which is, you know, really not good. Uh, it would be a multiple of the buffer size, but that doesn't help you that much, right? Um, the other problem is there is no feedback on over and underflow, which means if at, for any reason or anything you miss a buffer or anything, well, that random delay would actually vary over time, uh, which is really not good at all. Uh, so I kind of dropped the idea of using I.O. <laughs> for, uh, for that. Um, other fun things in I.O. is the naming of the, you know, you have, you have I.O. devices, and inside those devices you have channels. And, and the mapping of what does what is really not that obvious. I mean, if you see, you know, CF89361 LPC, that's the receive path. Uh, you know, there is... Eric's absolutely nowhere in that name. And then cf 18361 ddscore core dash lpc that's the transmit path. And why? Um, and um, somewhere buried in the documentation, you can find what, it, what does what. But when you first um, go into it, it's really not obvious. Uh, I actually documented what does what in, if you look in the source code of the control application, I actually documented what names map, maps to what, in case you're confused. Uh, yeah. And of course, I still need to use I/O because I need to actually start up the device, stuff like that. And I, I you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel, and and so I just reuse I/O. But it just um, sets up the frequency again and uh, and configure my custom logic. So the custom logic, well, since I can't do it in I/O, I decide to do it uh, directly in the FPGA, right? Uh, because it's really the you know the right uh, right way to do it anyway. Um, Again, the, the FPGA code through MEDI is actually pretty good. Um, it might be a little too generic for my taste. You can see it's an, you know, it's an example code that they distribute uh, so that people can take it and integrate it in, the, uh, in their own application. But that, that means that the, the very low code is actually supports the chip being interfaced using uh, LVDS or using CMOS or all those options, which are actually not used on the, on, on the, on the Pluto because, well, it's depends on your PCB layout, and obviously you can't change it dynamically. Um, um, so there's a bit too much option, so sometimes it can be hard to understand or, or see exactly what's used and what's not, but it's, it's fairly well structured and it didn't take too much time to, to see uh, what does what, and, and that part is actually uh, fairly well documented. Um, the modification is like super simple. Uh, basically, I just tap into the RX pass. You have a, a block that handles all the physical interface, you know, like the CMOS IO, the sampling of the DDA edge, and all that kind of stuff. And that feeds that to a packetizer and, and things that uh, sends it over to the zinc. I just tap the data at that point, feed it to a variable delay line, which uh, is really just a circular buffer where the, the read pointer and the write pointer. Uh, is, are at a fixed configurable offset from one another, and that offset is configured by the zinc, and that fixes your delay basically. And I directly inject it into the um, the transmit path. So the transmit path it can act as the normal, usual way it would 
normally works. You can use, still use your Pluto as a normal Pluto um, with no issue. But if you uh, toggle the right bit in the right config register, uh, instead of just transmitting what the DMA sends, it will actually take the signal it received, multiply it by a constant so you can vary its amplitude, and add it to the uh, signal that you asked uh, to transmit and send it off. Um, I did a, an addition uh, because that way if in addition to the loopback you want to add say Gaussian, Gaussian noise to test uh, you know, the SNR response, stuff like that, you can actually do it. And IO actually has a nice feature, I guess, that you can just give it one or a, a set of buffers and tell, it, tell them uh, to play in a loop. Um, and so you just set that up at the beginning and it will just uh, auto-repeat basically. Um, so yeah, that's a very simple uh, FPGA modification uh, and that could easily be extended. I mean, at the moment it's really just an addition, but if you put an FIR with complex taps, you could have uh, a channel uh, once to be one step closer to a channel simulator. And if you add multiple of those in parallel, you can have, um, you know, multipath uh, with different length uh, with, you know, fairly easy uh, modification. You can just Xilinx has free FIR compilers and stuff like that. So yeah, if anybody if anybody needs that, it's it's not too hard to do. Um, the control software, well, it really doesn't do much. It just <laughs> really just sets the frequency gains and that kind of stuff. Uh, trans, it does uh, continuous Eric's, but it does nothing with the data. <coughs> just drops it. Um, it transmits zero. Actually, turns out it's not even needed. I mean, I, you don't have. Once you've started the Rx, it will actually continue, and if you start the ticks, it will underflow or, or overflow if you don't actually shuffle the buffer, but the FPGA logic will continue to work, including the loopback, uh, which means that if you actually kill that application, uh, the loopback actually continues. <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't shut down on its own, um, which I consider it a feature, but maybe you can see it as a bug. It depends on, <laughs> on the way you see things, uh, whatever. Um, and yeah, there's not that many options. Um, something else that was developed and that's kind of interesting and it was developed at the same time but it's kind of unrelated to RFDS itself but it's just in the same repo is the UHD pinger because I needed to test the, the I mean what I developed I needed to I, I needed a way to actually test it, right? Um, I tr originally I, I planned to use my signal generator and the, the E4406 and that's when I realized that my E4433 is broken at the moment and I haven't taken the time to fix it yet. So I developed that instead. Um, and basically it measures the latency uh, using an UHD device. So it just sends uh, periodically a burst of uh, BPSK modulated data uh, out of the text port and using timestamp it does a synchronized RX and then it tries to find, okay, how many samples after I ordered the transmit do I get the pulse back? Um, and so using the transmit and receive on different frequency, I was able to test uh, the uh, Osmo RFDS um, that, uh, you know, I got the echo at the right time and that if I told uh, the delay simulator to simulate a 100 microsecond delay, I actually got the data 100 microsecond later that I tell him that if I tell it to simulate a zero sample delay, for instance. Um, but it can also be used uh, to just to test the intrinsic latency of a UHD device. Uh, if you look in the Osmo TRX, there's a bunch of magic values in there uh, that represent the kind of the latency of the FPGA image of the the, the B200 because you know it has digital signal processing blocks, CIC, uh, half band filters, um, CICs. I already said CICs, I think. Yeah, whatever. Uh, I meant the codec. Uh, yeah. Um, and all those magic values, they change depending on the sample rate, on the, the master clock rate that you configure and that kind of stuff. Uh, but in Osmo TRX, they're important because you need to, you know, know when RX and TX are aligned. And so you could actually use that to, to measure uh, those values and, and check that they actually make sense. Um, currently, I mean, it was done really quickly because it was just a tool to test Osmo RFDS. Um, improvements would be FFT-based correlation. At the moment, I just do a naive correlation of just, you know, 
summing and adding uh, at different offsets. But that takes time. If you use an FFT, you can go much faster. Um, also, currently, I just generate a random bitstream from UDEV random, I think, and BPSK modulate it, uh, which works fine. But if, if you wanted a sharper peak in the correlation, you could use codes that have good known autocorrelation properties, um, you know, like gold codes out of two, that kind of, um, you know, things that are used for trading sequences. Um, so that's an example of running the pinger, and you see you just uh, configure here uh, at a, a given frequency, and eventually you get, yeah, an echo, and it tells you how many uh, samples afterwards uh, it, was, uh, it was received. Uh, the other values are just the amplitude, I think. Yeah, the, the amplitude and the threshold. Um, it can also detect multiple peaks, uh, if there are several peaks that are strong enough. So a couple of resources. While well, you have the, the project, which has the, uh, the actual documentation of uh, um, how to run it, how to build it, and also some pre-built image that you can just flash. Yeah. I have a newbie question uh, on the previous slide. Yeah. Why is the transmit frequency different than the RX one? Oh yeah, because I, I was testing uh, over the air. Oh yeah, the, the, so the question is why is the transmit frequency different from the RX one? Uh, it's because uh, this particular test I was testing over the air, not with cables, and so I can't test. Uh, I mean, that there would have been a conflict if I uh, if I tell the Osmo RFDS to receive and transmit with a delayed version, it would create a loop, right? I mean, with cables, you can transmit and receive on the same frequency. The cross talk is um, small enough, but when you're over the air, it would kind of create a sort of, a, I don't know, like a Larson effect in, in RF or something. I just, yeah. You, you, you see, or? Because, I mean, if you, te if, if you tell him uh, Osmo RFDS to transmit the signal one microseconds later back, and you're over the air, it will. When it transmits it once one microsecond later, it will again re receive it and then re retransmit it one microsecond later, and so that creates a loop that, yeah. Microphone. Exactly. Yeah, like, like, uh, uh, An echo, produce echo, except RFDS actually uh, amplifies the signal as well. So, yeah, it, it just ends up saturating itself, basically. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, the, the project page with a pre built image, how to build it and uh, how to run it. Uh, the actual code, um, if you want to, you know, rebuild it yourself. And uh, this is the link that, to the documentation, to the Pluto uh, itself. It's the, the wiki uh, from uh, Analog, which has some uh, decent information about the, the Pluto and uh, how to build the image and uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, thank you for uh, thank you to Sysmocom to uh, sponsor the work on the on that project. And uh, and to Analog Device for actually providing us with uh, the Plutos. And uh, that's it. If anybody has any questions. Uh, regarding the uh, Pluto and the, the loop, is there some space left in the FPGA for, for example, for doing some uh, complex multiplication and modulation of the signal to generate some? Yes, there's plenty of space uh, left in the FPGA for uh, doing uh, a lot of things. I mean, I don't. I think there is like a, maybe like five percent of the uh, complex blocks, the, the DSP blocks used, uh, and also very few block RAMs. Um, there is a significant part of the lo logic elements used in the FPGA, but the block RAMs and the DSP blocks, there is plenty of them. To go around. So yeah, if you want to do complex multiplication or an FIR filter with complex tabs and that kind of stuff, plenty of space for that. Yeah. Well, I'll just repeat it. Just say it, and I will repeat okay. it in the microphone. Uh, re regarding the UHD pinger, uh, I'm doing exactly the same thing for uh, our mobile station implementation on SDR. And uh, is it uh, available somewhere uh, in these repositories? Yeah, so, so, so the question is about the UHD pinger, uh, because in the, in the MS implementation uh, by Piotr, uh, there is something similar. And uh, yes, the UHD pinger is uh, also, it's in the Osmo RFDS uh, repository in the tools directory or something. And so it's there, yeah, in that repo. Yeah. 
the question, it's very quick. Um, so, uh, how much delay can you simulate given the memory and, uh, that you have available in the FPGA? Do you have an idea? Well, of course, it depends on the sample rate. Yes. <laughs> so, so the question is how much delay can be simulated. Um, I honestly can't remember, um, but it was very significant. It was, it was more than a more than a multiple time more than a GSM frame. I remember that, uh, and I didn't use all the programs that I could have used. I, I left a ton of them free. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's definitely. Um, Significant, as as you say, it depends on the sample rate. But I was uh, kind of uh, uh, working on uh, like a one or two mega samples per second because it was for GSM, and that's that's way enough. Um, but yeah, as I said, the the, des the default design of the uh, uh, of the ADI doesn't actually use a significant amount of block RAMs. Uh, for some. Yeah, I can't. Uh, for some reason, my re my browser doesn't display, but whatever. Um, um, so most of the block, it's a Zinc 7010, and yeah, I'm pretty sure like 90% of the block RAM are free. So you know, look up the specs and do the math for. And I mean, the Pluto SDR uh, typically is limited to that rather narrow uh, or low sample rates because there's the USB. But since uh, all of this happens inside the FPGA, of course, you can. In theory, at least, use the full sample rate of the of the RF front end, right? So I'm just thinking whether, for example, this could also be used with a 10 megahertz uh, uh, LTE channel to simulate the timing of our Yes. So uh, um, the the question is about the sample rate, uh, um, and uh, yes, because as you say, the everything happens in the FPGA. You're not limited either by the bandwidth of the USB or even by the processing power of the zinc or anything like that. Um, so yeah, you can. I, th I think you can run it up to 30.72 mega samples per second in the way they're wired in the uh, um, the Pluto, uh, basically. Um, the, the maximum sample rate of the chip is is uh, 60 or something. But depending on how they wired the FPG interface to the uh, FP uh, to the ADI, uh, yeah, the ADI to the, to the FPGA. Um, the interface can only run uh, at a given clock frequency, and you, you need to have transmit and receive enabled, of course. Uh, and so I think the limit is 30.72. But yeah, I mean, to simulate LTE at a 10 megahertz bandwidth would be no issue. Of course, you get you know less delay because you, need, you have more samples, but uh, it should be more than enough to. Uh, I mean, you, you can dynamically configure the delay, but obviously at the point where you change it, you have a discontinuity, right? Uh, it, it's not going to do like fractional interpolation or progressively change the delay. You can progressively change it one sample at a time, I guess, uh, but you will have a small non-linearity at the time where you, where you change it. Uh, whether, I, I guess if you oversample enough, it shouldn't distort the signal too much if you change it uh, progressively enough, basically. But you, the, the core definitely uh, supports changing the delay on the fly uh, while everything is running. No, not at the moment. Uh, it would it would be fairly easy to. Uh, um, to simulate multipath because you can just instantiate a second block and a second adder and have uh, both configurable, for instance. Um, Doppler also could be added to simulate Sorry? Doppler. Yes, yeah, yeah, you could, you could uh, um, add a, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, oh yeah, I, I made a mistake. It's, it, should, it should say codec here and not CIC because CIC wouldn't help to add a frequency error. But yeah, you could, you could add a, a complex multiplier with a codec to, uh, Simulate a frequency error and simulate Doppler. Yeah, there's a bunch of. As I said, because most of the, the DSP blocks are free and the block RAMs are free too, um, there's lots of room for uh, extension if anybody wants to uh, to do that or needs it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.